Great. Thanks. Yeah, Frank. good. Hello, and everyone, and welcome. So glad you're with us for our last workshop of the Designing for Empathy Summit and Workshops for 2021. My name is Greg Stevens, and I will turn the stage over to my colleague and friend, Elif Shortly, who will introduce our workshop facilitators. But I do wanna just remind all of you that our program is being recorded, and you'll be able to access the recording at a later date. Also, you might notice that we have closed caption transcriptions enabled right now. So if that is a service of benefit to you, please do take advantage of that. And before I turn it over to Elif, I do want to offer two land acknowledgements. The first one is in New York City, which is the home, uh, the traditional home of the Lenape peoples. We honor and respect the traditional stewards of this land. And also, Elif, I know that you're in Washington, D.C., the traditional home of the Anacostan peoples, and Washington, D.C. also borders on the lands of the Piscataway and Palmenkai people. So collectively, we honor and respect these people who have been stewarding this land for generations. And with that, it is my great pleasure to welcome Elif Gossikem. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, thank you, Lidaway and Catherine, for uh, being here for this workshop, our last workshop for this year's summit. Really looking forward to it. Uh, I just would like to take a, a minute or two to give some uh, background on why we are doing this, who are we, what is this platform, and then I'll quickly introduce you. Actually, I'll let you introduce yourselves after my brief uh, uh, sort of context providing. Uh, and uh, I'm Elif Gökçidem. Uh, I use pronouns she and her, and I serve as the founder and president of ONE. And Designing for Empathy Summit and Workshop is curated and organized by ONE, Organization of Networks for Empathy. ONE was just formed earlier this year as a small consulting firm to help shape our culture around empathy, while positioning cultural institutions as incubators of empathy building through cross sectors collaboration and innovation. Designing for Empathy is a unique transdisciplinary and cross-sectors framework that creates a variety of platforms for individuals from different backgrounds, disciplines, and sectors to come together and collectively develop solutions to the empathy deficit in our world. We believe that our ability to develop individuals' capacity for empathy towards the oneness of all beings, all of humanity, the environment, and the planet lies at the heart of our ability to solve our most complex problems. The challenges we face today from social injust injustice to climate change are not because we lack the intellectual capacity, the technologies, or the resources to tackle them, but they are because caring for others as much as we care for ourselves, which makes us want to take action to solve another's suffering, requires a major perspective shift. This is where we stop seeing ourselves as the centers of the universe, but rather as integral parts of a whole uh, of which we are all a part. When we realize we are parts of a whole, we tend to calibrate and harmonize our attitudes, behaviors, and actions to preserve uh, the harmony within this whole or unity. This pragmatic perspective shift can only be achieved through a lived experience. And empathy, our ability to imagine the world through another's perspective, provides the foundation. And that's where designing for empathy comes in. We believe that because empathy can be best learned through lived experiences, creating those authentic experiences where individuals can discover, unlock, and advance their potential for empathy in safe and non judgmental spaces become more essential. Designing for empathy provides framework. Uh, through which empathy and empathy building tools are explored and developed uh, for application in a variety of contexts, disciplines, and sectors. With that, uh, we are, today's um, challenge is quite timely, as we know, all the, you know, the climate talks are uh, going on. Uh, and uh, I would love uh, our friends from em Empathic Intervision, uh, Lida Wayneasing and doc uh, Dr. Lida Wayneasing and Dr. Catherine Train to please introduce themselves and lead, lead us uh, through the workshop. Thank you. Welcome. Lovely. Great. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Yeah. And welcome, everyone. So 
nice to see so many people joining us and we know bits from all over the world. I'm based in France myself. I was just talking about my office. I'm in this old 250 year old house where I very much feel a guest ever since I live here because I keep thinking of all those who've gone before me and who might have gone after, going after in this place. I'm a psychologist by um, profession. I've been studying empathy. I've been doing a PhD on empathy and social psychology. Um, and I started this work 20 years ago. And so I've been doing quite a bit of scholarly work around empathy and then decided that's nice, all that theory, but what about the practice? How do we do this? And that's uh, where Catherine and I have found each other about seven years back. We found each other in a project together where we started working together and we've been building empathic intervision, which is all about delivering different practices of empathy. And we'll tell a bit more about that later on. Thanks, Lidre. And yeah, we, we get to hear our, each other's introductions so often, so we can almost introduce each other by now. Okay. I'm Kath Catherine Train and I'm in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, I actually started out my career, well, mid-career as a pharmacist, so in the medical field, um, and really kind of entered empathy from a different perspective. I um, realized that while having technical skills as a pharmacist, I really didn't have the training to be able to deal with the um, inter interaction with people. Um, and so that led me on a whole journey of partly training and researching to understand particularly um, practicing empathy with people in a healthcare context when there are resource limitations. So in the context of compassion fatigue and burnout, and also where we have a lot of people working with others where both the practitioner and the um, people they're working with are traumatized. So that's where my empathy background comes from. I worked um, for some years in training practitioners, so working mainly with healthcare practitioners, and then worked, um, moved into social services, um, and then more generally into organizations as a whole. So I have a PhD from the Graduate School of Business in Cape Town, um, and that really led me into empathy practice in the broader sense in organizations. Yeah, and really excited to be here. Um, climate change and environment is really a passion for me. It's a, it's kind of a home project. So it's, it's not um, where my professional work lies, but absolutely a, um, something that I live with on a daily basis. So very excited to be here um, with you for this um, workshop. Mm. Yeah. Also quite daunting, hey, the climate change. <laughs> I've been spending lots and lots of time in it over the past to prepare for this workshop over the past weeks and whew, we're tackling problems, hey, it is enormous. Very so we're so happy to see, see so many of you and to give it a try together. What we want to be doing together is we are not experts in climate change, right? We're not, um, we don't feel like we can be telling you much new maybe there we tell you a few things but this is not but we know a thing or two about empathy and what we'd like to do with you is really flex our specifically our imaginative empathy and our self empathy muscles together and see and dis discover together if it is possible to use these empathic tools to tackle these type of problems and so let's come back to that at the end of this workshop and decide together whether this is a useful tool for this type of problem or not. We think it could be. We will try to lead you through a process that might um, work. And it's very much up to you to give us a, a verdict on that by the end of it and see, and see if it brings something or not. So each session, we always start with an intention, just like, like Elif did for the conference. We believe that empathy is a means to an end. And so it's very important to look at what is the end? What are we trying to do with this empathic behavior? And so we set a common intention 
for all of us, and maybe we could switch back to having a, a gallery view so that we can actually see each other. We would also love you to switch on your screens, your videos, don't be shy, we don't bite. I'm switching back to gallery view. Yay, I love seeing all the people, that's great. Thank you for switching on. Yeah, so an, a common intention that we'd like to start with, and that common intention is in the coming two hours, we will unpack a climate related issue with imaginative empathy resulting in one action we commit to take in the coming month. So in the coming two hours, unpack a climate related issue with imaginative empathy resulting in one action you would like to take in the coming month. Could I get a hands up for that if you think I'm in for that intention? That'll work for me, yeah? Great, 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 great. Thank you. Yeah, good. Yeah, so, so we'd really like just to hear very briefly from all of you. And so we invite you to write in the chat. So if we were to have all of us speaking, we would perhaps be here too long, but we'd invite you to write in the chat. What is your interest in this workshop? So we'll, we'll see your names and we will also know something about what brings you here? What is your interest and what do you hope to gain from the workshop? And thanks for the question, Kate, an individual activity, something you could set for yourself. So what, what is your interest in this workshop? So Jim Wharton from Seattle Aquarium, ocean health and climate are closely related. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Very intimately related. And yet it's also interesting, eh, Jim, that we see so much um, results of the climate problems in the ocean while so much of the of the causes of these problems have nothing to do with it eh? it's mm. just like it's like mm. like the rivers all ends in the ocean and dana yeah. i'm interested in understanding how empathy can be used to understand climate change and the possibility of using empathy as a tool to educate about climate change so I'm going to read them very quickly, just so, and then we can perhaps refer back to them later. So Mark Wenzer, I've been a climate activate, act, advocate, litigator, lobbyist for 25 years in Washington, DC, and see how we have made no progress with the American public when we rely simply on facts and experts. We need some new tools and empathy holds much promise to begin to move Americans in the right direction. Fantastic. And I would like to add to that, not just Americans, eh? mm. all over the world. Golda, learn more about imaginative empathy for social conditions. Megan, I believe climate change is one of the most pressing issues of our time, and I'm excited to learn about how empathy can be utilized to help mitigate. Mm. Zara Abbas, I'd like to actively build more empathy for animals. Animal agriculture and climate change are closely related. Yeah. Yeah. Kate, I'm motivated to align two things I think about all the time, climate change and empathy, and mm -hmm. find a way to a more personally tranquil way to choose and enact the world elements I commit to. I like the idea of imaginative and see potential in that as a linking element. Mm -hmm. Elif, looking forward to learning some tips to drive behavior change in my day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm to make it really practical. Sarah, I'm curious to learn more about communicating effectively and empathically, empathetic ally with others around climate change, but also eager to explore my own feelings of cynicism and helplessness through a lens of empathy. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when things Perhaps don't change, fast enough. Help me tap back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
mm. Katerina, archaeologist, museumologist, working with children, young people and families in art therapy, Athens, would be interested to get familiar with empathic tools. I've incorporated nature in workshops, so would like to look more into it. Mm. So very, very, very diverse interests, hey? Yeah, so let's see. Where we and Alison comes in. I'm an empathy scholar. I'm interested in what imaginative empathy is defined and how it relates to other types of empathy. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely to have you with us, Alison. Yeah, very diverse. And Sarah, I'm also this despair that surrounds this climate change. Mm. I've been quite um, engulfed in that as well in the past week that the more you get into it the more you think how how ever are we going to tackle this problem and i have a nice i found a very nice quote about that which i'll which i'll share with you if we have time in the end yeah so the first question maybe to really look at before we dive into the process itself is why is empathy useful in climate problems and maybe again you could just put it up in the chats you can just put you can just shout out it doesn't have to be full sentences why is empathy useful <coughs> and i see lotta we have another one as well mm. hoping to learn how empathy can be part of inclusion and justice in and mm. with climate change fantastic yeah Empathy helps bridge political divides. Yeah. Potentially and hopefully. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Motivated for action. How, Megan, could you, could you, how do you think empathy motivates for action? Would you speak to that? You're welcome to speak up if you feel like. Yeah. Um, I just think that if it, it helps people to care that if you if you haven't thought about it before like what either what climate change is doing to other people and but now you like you maybe are in their perspective and thinking about how they are being impacted by it in a different way than you are mm -hmm. and then you want to do something about that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so through being touched in one way or another the empathy leads to action yeah thanks megan yeah Climate is a fundamentally collective issue, absolutely. Mm. Get us to mm. really care enough to inspire action. Yeah, the care related to our collective journeying on this planet. Climate can be a large faceless systemic issue. Perhaps empathy can help give people a focal point. Yeah, great, Jim, yeah. Empathy may allow to better appreciate nature and our interactions with her. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, would it, you think, Catherine? Yeah, I think so. But I, I do think that there, there, there needs to be skill in, mm. in facilitating it. I don't think it's necessarily automatic. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. But it is yeah. interesting how we can empathize with inanimate, um, with objects. Yeah. In nature, absolutely. I teach using empathy when communicating controversial science like climate change. Yeah, oh, interesting, mm. controversial mm. science, yeah. And one of the great things we get out of it is the ability to start a dialogue and build trust with one another. Yeah, absolutely, rather than emphasis on persuasion. Mm. That yeah. is also something that is key, I think, to what we'll be doing today. This, it's not about the emphasis on persuasion, hey? empathy, great help activate groups beyond differences to serve the needs of the world. Yeah. And climate change requires a collective response. Empathy could be used to bring people together in formulating this response. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, we have been setting mm. the bar high. <laughs> <laughs> well, so how about we get, we get started? What do you think? <laughs> yeah. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share my screen here and we're going to talk a little bit about um, what we mean by empathy. And so first thing is that we believe empathy is neutral. So there's um, a lot of kind of perception that empathy is good and empathy is always good, but empathy can be used in a way to manipulate. Um, and so in and of itself, it is neutral. 
but very much depending on the intentionality. So what does the person who is empathizing intend? And so we always work with empathy alongside intentionality. It's also a very complex skill. So there's a number of different elements that are things that one can actually do on a, in a, at a level of skill. And so it's very important that you match that skill, that empathy skill to the context of what you're wanting to achieve when you empathize. And we believe that it's impossible to empathize all the time. So one is applying empathy in a way to a means to an end in a particular context. We, um, Lida Bay and I together, have worked with a lot of um, different disciplines of empathy where it's studied and researched. And we've come up um, with five elements or five particular skills. And I'm just going to very briefly name them to you. And then we'll dive a little bit deeper into two of them today. So we start out always with self-empathy. And this is about knowing where do I come from when I empathize? What are my potential biases and what are my projections potentially? Then there's also kinesthetic empathy and that's about connecting with other people through nonverbal interactions. So pretty much um, body language, um, how one interacts on, on a physical level, um, holding space for other people as well as a part of that. Then there's reflective empathy and this is verbally listening. So listening not to react, but listening to um, reflect back to a person and to demonstrate understanding of what you've heard. And then imaginative empathy, the one that we're going to really dig um, dive deeply in today, which is about diversifying perspectives. So it's about, um, on the one hand, identifying different perspectives, um, and then being able to take the perspective of other, um, other people, other perspectives, and in that way, being able to diversify and understand those different perspectives. And then that all leads into empathic creativity, which we don't actually see as a skill in and of itself, but it's about taking what you have understood or what you've gleaned from the other four skills and moving that into action. So making your insights that you've, you've gained through empathizing into um, actionable outcomes and ensuring that that intentionality, so it actually takes you back to your intentionality in terms of setting the intention and moving that forward into action. So we will, as I say, we're going to concentrate particularly on the self-empathy and on the imaginative empathy today as we work together with the climate change. So muscles, hey, muscles, we need to warm them up. So I'm also going to share my screen. I'm going to show you a picture. I hope, yes, you're seeing this picture, right? This is a picture of a very gray day. Our day is about as gray, you wouldn't say so because I'm full of lights around me, but our day is as gray as this day. And I'd like you to have, just take it in for a moment, just have a look at this picture. And while you're doing that, I'm going to zoom in a bit. Ah, excellent. On these two men. And I would like you to choose one of these two men. Just pick one of these two men, whichever speaks to you at the moment. And keep an eye on this man. I'm going to ask you a number of questions about them. So let me give you a bit more context of these men again. If you have, like me, this bar on the side in the middle and you think, I want it elsewhere, you can pick us up, that black bar with all our heads. You can pick us up and you can move us around the screen. For instance, you can move us to the bottom or to the top of the screen, or you leave us where, where we are. It's all good. So please have a look at the person that you've just been choosing. And I will ask you a number of questions about this person. Step into that person and imagine, where are you? And what are you doing?
are you aware of each other? What are you focused on? Are you aware of your environment? And how is your state of mind? And now I'd like to ask you to just for yourself write up in one sentence what you imagine that this fisherman that you've just been choosing has to say right now, has to say to the world. Just take a, a moment and imagine one sentence. What do you have to say to the world? So everybody who's been choosing the man with the baseball cap on his head, the man who turns his back towards us, could you maybe raise your hands? Can we raise our hands while I'm sharing my screen? I think we can, eh? Because I have to scroll through. I'm just going to scroll through and I'm, I'm doing it by name of who I'm seeing. And I'm gonna ask you to share with us this one sentence. What do you have to say to the world? So this is only about the men with the baseball cap. I think Megan is the first on my list who chose this man. Megan, could you tell us, what do you have to say to the world? Uh, same, same thing, day in and day out. Same thing, day in and day out, great. Jim, did you have this man? No, Golda? No, Zara? Yes, Zara, what do you have to say to the world? Stop polluting our seas. Stop polluting our seas. Yeah, thanks. Mark, did you have, did you chose this man? Yes, I, um, help me feed my family. Help me feed my family, great. Kate, did you choose this man? Yeah. Um, I am mending nets with my friend. I am mending nets with my friend. Great, thank you. And Katerina? Uh, may the wind uh, sweep away all the rubbish. <laughs> ah, may the wind sweep away all <laughs> rubbish. Fantastic, thank you. And then Alison. Alison, maybe not. Aparna, did you choose this man? Yeah, what do you have to say to the world? Well, you have to unmute. Sorry. Uh, I was wondering, you know, maybe he's thinking, will I get food amidst all this, you know, all this plastic and everything? Will there still be fish to feed my family? Ah, will there still be fish to feed my family? Will I get food in this situation? Thanks. Greg, did you happen to choose this man? Okay, so then I, I did, but I was thinking, I was thinking, um, what a, a hard life. What a hard life. Haha. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Greg. And Ray, Rene, is it Rene? Yes. I chose the, the other guy. guy. Okay. Sorry, thanks. So I, I, think... so I also chose this guy. Yeah. And, and I was, I'm just sharing a fairly chilled, companionable moment with my partner. Hmm. Thanks. Yeah. And then we still have, is there anybody else? Maybe I'll just ask you to speak up. Dana, Sarah, Lotte, Safia. Did anybody else choose this man? No? Okay, so that means you all chose the other. We have a lot to say about the other. Let's start, let's start again. So 
Um, Elif, Elif, you're the first in my list. Elif, what do you have to say to the world? Um, I think he would say, this is the only way how I know to feed my family. Hmm. Thanks, Elif. And Jim? I, I think he might say it wasn't always like this. It wasn't always like this. Interesting, yeah. And Golda? Mending, mending, mending. <laughs> mending, mending, mending. Great. Thanks, Golda. And Megan, I think, Megan, you chose this one, or did you choose the previous one? This one, eh? I, I did the previous one. Thank oh, you. Oh, you did the previous. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so then we have Alison. Alison's not sure. Rene? Uh, Alison put it on the chat. Okay, perfect. So what Alison says is, given how many different ideas everyone has, we cannot all be correct in what this man is thinking. In fact, <laughs> we're probably all incorrect. I wonder, <laughs> does accuracy matter? Alison, I think you're preempting. <laughs> Often psychologists Alison. define how good we are at empathy by how accurate we are. Is perhaps there a benefit to just trying without succeeding? Sorry. Great. <laughs> Rain thanks, outside. thanks, Alison. Thanks, Alison. We'll come back to this. Rene has to say to the world, sigh, right? And Dana, or Dana. Hi, um, it is Dana. Um, yeah. I'm sort of struggling to, to come up with something to say because um, all of the thoughts that come to my head, I keep thinking, what are what assumptions am I making about who these two people are? Mm -hmm. um, and, and how might those assumptions be incorrect and that um, it's making it difficult for me to, to kind of come up with one thing to say. Perfectly fine. Thanks for sharing that, Dana. And Sarah? Yes, is that for Sarah Brinkert? Yes, that's you. Okay, I, I wasn't sure. I thought there might be a couple of us. Um, I projected on my, my person uh, the thoughts, feelings that there, it feels there's very little under my control. There are powerful forces that are destroying my life and my livelihood and my community. And no way, nothing I can control except yeah. what's right in front of me. Yeah, yeah. You were breaking up a bit, Sarah, but I think we got it. Hey, there's powerful forces that are determining, it's not in my control, that are determining what happens in my life, my community. Yeah, thanks. And Lotte? I hope my children can keep fishing for a living one day. Ah, yeah, thanks Lotte, mm. yeah. Mm. And Safia? Hi, um, I agree about struggling with um, projecting my um, uh, my assumptions on these mm. two individuals. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's great. I think that's a that's a wonderful reaction, right? And that's exactly one of the points we're trying to make with this type of exercise. Yeah. So, so it is. It is really interesting how um, you know there are so many different perspectives that we have each come up with, um, and also a lot of comments around projection and concerns around projection, and also empathic accuracy and how possible actually is it to be empathically accurate, and so just um, really a very brief and quite broad. Um, introduction to perspective taking. Um, and you're absolutely right that um, empathic accuracy is very low. Um, they estimate between 25 and 35 percent, which is, is not high at all. Um, so, you know, do we have any hope of actually being able to really understand and take the perspective of other people? So basically to say, um, 
when we refer to imaginative empathy, we are looking at a basis of perspective taking, but we are also adding certain other elements to that. Um, and so perspective taking is basically about imagining what thoughts and feelings other people have or might have. Um, it's very often um, synonymous with cognitive empathy. So we have um, two main branches of empathy being cognitive empathy and affective empathy and the perspective taking would be um, often um, associated or synonymized with the um, cognitive empathy. So the, the kind of natural reflex when we, we talk about very often when we ask people, you know, what do you mean by empathy? And they say stepping into another person's shoes. And the natural reflex is to imagine how I would experience that situation. And that is absolutely where we, we kind of potentially hit upon the stumbling block of, you know, we have our biases, we have our preconceptions. Um, it's pretty much what we see the world through is you know, all, all that history, all that culture, whatever experiences we've had in our upbringing um, and going back through culture, you know, our culture. And that is what we see the world through. And so that is what we're likely to see when we look at a picture or when we try to take the perspective of another person. So this is what we would call the imagined self perspective. And that is a self-oriented perspective taking. This is not empathy. This is, as it, you know, as it says, the imagined self perspective. When we're talking about empathy, what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to imagine the other. So the other oriented perspective, and we're wanting to know what would they think, what would they feel given their situation. And what we can see is it's not an easy task. And so we're going to take you through some exercises of some of the things that we feel one can do to add to this in order to flex that muscle, practice actually being able to take the perspective of another people, of another person or other people. And first step is really being able to get in touch with one's own biases, one's own prejudices, one's own preconceptions. And these are so kind of deeply embedded in everything that we are, um, that it's sort of the first step and, and one of the really difficult steps. And that's where we work with self-empathy as an approach to becoming more aware of what we're bringing to an interaction um, and how that might color our perceptions and our perspectives of other people. So Maybe we also, also to add to that, Catherine, is then, you know, what Alison was talking about, you know, we are projecting and is there even a point to doing this and that not to underestimate how often we do this because we have limited mental resources, right? So if we are not very consciously trying to take a perspective of another person, what we often do is automatically step into their shoes, right? It's the most easy way to go in like, oh, what would it be like if I would be this sea urchin? And if you would be that sea urchin, you would have all sorts of um, uh, mental, mental life and, and physical life and sensing and all sorts of things, right? So what we do is bringing ourselves to that perspective. And I think you're right, Alison, that, you know, is accuracy important? Well, it's definitely important in the sense that if you're trying, like with this climate problem, if you're trying to find solutions that are adaptive for the people or the oceans or the plants or the animals that you're trying to empathize with, then you really need to step out of that projection and into those perspectives. Did I, did I interrupt yeah. you in the middle, Catherine? <laughs> no, no, you didn't. You just added to the end. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Great. Thanks so, for that. So we're going to introduce one of the many, many, many issues that there are around climate change that we'll be working with um, in the rest, in the coming hour, in the rest of this workshop. And so that issue that we picked is one of the issues that is also at the front of what we see about climate change in the world, and that is plastic pollution. 
And as I just had a small one-on-one -on -one with Jim, that plastic pollution, where do we see that plastic pollution? Well, one place where we definitely see it a lot is in the oceans. So just to introduce this topic, I'm going to show you three minutes of a fantastic documentary of which I'll put the link in the chat afterwards, um, which is came out not that long ago, um, and it's called The Story of Plastic. And maybe you've seen it already. Now let me, Greg, share sound, optimize for video clip. I'm doing this. Let me share the right thing with you. Bear with me. I'm talking you through it. There we go. Are you seeing a big black screen right now? Yes, we are. Perfect. So I'm going to roll it and let me know if, the, if there's no sound. Sounds good. Great, thanks. Here's a scene that has long since ceased causing any surprise. The women folk washing dishes made of plastic. Dishes that hurts when they drop to the floor. Hard to realize it, but it was only 10 years ago that the first pound of polystyrene plastic was sold. And the chemical age is just dawning. These few things, my friends, are only a hint of what American industry holds in the future. Yes, Mylar's properties are right in its molecules. And with them are coming new and better things for us all. Today will be a better day for a lot of people. Simply because of a material we call plastic. This industry is well positioned to build on our accomplishments, to shape a sustainable and prosperous future. In summary, we believe the best is yet to come. like many people, I had noticed a real surge of attention and interest in the issue of plastic pollution. This article came about from conversations with activists who are working on plastics issues. Oftentimes what I do is ask people that are close to an issue how they feel about the media coverage. And one thing I was consistently hearing was that there was a gap in coverage when it came to the front end of the story. So there was a ton of attention around the final stage of the plastics life cycle when it actually becomes pollution. But not as many people were telling the story about where plastic comes from. And that life cycle is what we'd like to be discussing with you and what we're going to dive deeper into. So there's a real lot, lot, lot to say about all of this. And I, we can do only that much. So I would like to share a few facts, a few things about this problem with you. And then we will take you through um, the rest of the process. Oh, you're not watching my screen at the moment, are you? Yes, we are. <laughs> well, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. It'll come back. Okay, so the plastic, um, imaginative empathy and the issue of plastic pollution. So just a few things to know about this plastic pollution. First of all, what we learned in this documentary is 91% of plastic never gets recycled. So maybe just like me, all of you are doing really your best to um, separate your plastics from other um, stuff, 91% gets never recycled. 
And plastic that does get recycled can only be recycled once. And of all the plastic in the world at this moment in time, 50% of it is produced in the last 15 years. So there's a huge acceleration of plastic production in the world. And since I believe it was in 2018 or 2019, China stopped um, export, uh, importing plastic from the West. <clears throat> so they refused our exported plastic. Most of the plastic is now ending up in the backyards of um, the poorest people in the world in countries like Thailand and Vietnam. And while we're saying that Asia has a plastic problem and there's, and there's a lot of problems with plastic coming from Asia, it is in essence a Western problem. Most of it is produced here, most of it is exported from here to other parts of the world. And when I say here, United States, Europe, are the main players in that. Um, and I missed the last one. The problems resulting from plastic are spread over the entire product production chain. And this is that production chain. So it starts with the extraction of gas and oil in the ground. And in the US, we have a lot of fracking going on. We have, of course, an enormous oil industry that is being transformed. Um, through pipelines transformed into plastic production, which is then going to distribution, distribution centers, sent out um, to shops all over the world, ending up in our houses as consumers and in our trash. And from there, it either goes into incinerators or it ends up in the oceans or it ends up in landfills. The daunting issue of plastic pollution. Catherine. Yeah, so wow, you know, it's, if one really kind of engages with all of that, it, it can be very daunting and it can bring up a lot. I know that you know, if, I, if I observe myself, it just, it can really bring up a lot. I actually would, um, Greg, like to have us on gallery view. If I, can I um, put us all back onto gallery view? great I'd really like to be able to see you um, so what do we do about it because you know if, if we're completely overwhelmed or kind of crippled by our own challenges and difficulties it makes it very difficult to actually engage productively with other people on the topic um, yeah and and what we what we see so often in in so many of these issues now is just an increasing Kind of polarization so you find very strong um, perceptions about issues on both sides or on many different sides of of the issue and people just enforcing and entrenching and enforcing and entrenching that deeply rooted polarization so what do we do about it if we are to be able to um, kind of contain ourselves in some way to be able to actually make a difference so this is where we always start with self-empathy. So where are we actually coming from? And what do we want to do? What type of space do we want to hold for other people in order to be able to kind of understand where other people are coming from, to be able to um, become more aware of their perspective from their own perspective in their context, and to hold a space to become more aware of that. So I'm going to take you through a brief self-empathy exercise um, because this is where we feel we potentially can st as a starting point. So I'd like for you to just take a moment and think, how do you relate to this issue of plastic pollution that we've just introduced? So some quite shocking statistics, some equally shocking images, how do you relate to this issue of plastic pollution? What does it bring up for you? Just take a moment and to arrive to your own experience. And it might help you to just kind of lower your eyes or move away from the screen or from awareness of the other people in this Zoom room. And to notice What's going on inside of you? 
So notice your mood. What mood does it stimulate in you? And I invite you to write in the chat. What mood does this bring up for you? Frustration, frustration, stress and anxiety. Frustration, one, unstable connection, so keeping video off. Fear, sadness, overwhelmed, anger, frustration, concern, guilt, grief, responsibility, helplessness. It also brings mm -hmm. back a memory of watching ships, ship loaded with plastic bottles arriving at the, at the coast of Chennai. So guilt, but also I try small steps and shame. Yeah, it brings really, really strong mood and emotions, very strong experiences. And also there's an experience in your body. So these are kind of more than mood. How does it actually sit in your body, these experiences? So if you just kind of sense into your body, what is going there? Maybe take a moment and put your hand on the place where you experience it in your body. So pit of the stomach, rolling belly. Yeah, I was going to ask, what are the sensations? Can you describe that sensation? Tense version of cringe. Stiffening neck side of my neck that regularly stiffen. So those experiences actually become somatic, right? They actually kind of have an effect on the body. And some of that can be quite enduring. Empty, hopeless feeling in my chest. Deep sigh, heavy weight of stress in my tummy. Fight, not flight. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. And then pressure in shoulders pushing downward. So that's a lot of sensation. Hmm? So just take a moment with that. Just be with it for a moment. And I'm going to ask you the question. Will that mood, those um, physical sensations, will they be useful for you in trying to find solutions? So we, we're going to step into looking at different approaches, different perspectives. Do you think that that way of being, how you arrive, how you are right now, will be useful in helping you to find a solution, take other people's perspectives? Anyone? Absolutely. <laughs> Some of those frustrations, right? It sounds like some of them have a lot of energy. So I can make it so. No, the negative feelings and hopelessness just make me feel like there's nothing I can do personally. And it makes, yeah. makes the problem feel out of my hands. Yeah, absolutely. So we talk about intention setting with empathy. So if we're wanting now, we're going to go into imaginative empathy. We're wanting to understand something about the perspectives of others in the whole stakeholder chain. What, how do you feel you would like to be? What do you think would be productive for you? So also realizing that the hopelessness makes me passive. So try to think of messages that include hope and action. So deal with the stress. So I'm going to invite you to set and make an intention. So imagine first what, what state of being, what kind of way of being in this moment for the next hour do you feel would be more productive for you? And set an intention about that. And I invite you to write that in the chat as well.
So deal with the stress. So can you say what what could you do? What would you do to deal with the stress? Something that's quite particular. An attempt to eat with the stress. Uh, to be able to show that a life free of single use plastic is a happier, better, more satisfying life. So Mark, in this moment, for the next hour, what, what, would you, what could you do to be able to lead towards that? Your mood, your state of being in this next few, next hour, being mindful of my own plastic contribution. I want to channel the frustration into actions that are compounded by others and that generate change up the chain of production. Mm -hmm. Think of this like a game to play. Mm -hmm. More recycling, collecting rubbish from the beach. So I but see a lot in of the coming action. hour, Katerina. <laughs> we I want see you a here. lot of potential action. Maybe in the next month, maybe in the next year. What about <laughs> right now? So we're going to put you maybe a little bit of a context. We're going to put you into groups to in, uh, encourage you to take the perspectives of some of those quite tricky perspectives. What do you feel you would need right now in the next hour to be able to do that? So Alison is unfortunately have to go to another meeting. So I'm going to ask Lida Bay, what, what would you need to be present for the next moment to be able to? I, if I need to have like, I need to put a new pair of glasses on. That's what I need. I need to not be overwhelmed, not be stressed, not be all that I've experienced in the past week while going through this topic. I need to just regroup myself and reopen myself to, to yeah, explore this further. So I, I intend to reopen myself. <laughs> Thank you. So, so, so really just, a, maybe if you could just take another moment and think in the next moment, the next few minutes, how would you like to be? So Mark says to think expansively. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask Mark, if you are to think expansively right now, how would that feel? If you were to view, I, I don't remember your bodily experiences before, but if you were to transform your experience now into more of a, an expansive thinking, how would that feel in your body right now? Can you feel yourself thinking expansively? Feels more hopeful <clears throat> and less stressful. Feel, feels hopeful. And, and you, you're able to actually almost kind of create an expansive experience in your body? Working on it. Working on it. Mm, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so just, just like the empathy muscle, the ability to be able to kind of, you know, get over one's complete feeling of overwhelmment or one's guilt or one's shame, it's a, it's a muscle. And again, it takes practice. But in terms of being able to take the perspective, particularly of some of those perspectives that we might experience to be quite tricky, requires us to on the one hand, be able to regulate our emotions, and on the other hand, to be able to flex our um, mental abilities. And so again, that is a muscle. So in a sense, this is what self-empathy is. It's about how do we modify the way that we are in the moment in order that we can be more present, hold a space, and be able to be more open to what another person might present from their perspective. So I think, yeah, that's perhaps a good enough introduction of self-empathy at this moment. So we are going to now present you with a number of perspectives. So from that production chain, 
literally from the extraction of the oil um, from the ground through the refinement, through the production of packaging and whatever it might be into um, where we eventually see it sitting on our beaches in masses of pollution and, and um, destruction. What are some of the um, perspectives that we might encounter along the way? And so we are going to um, have the perspectives here. We're going to put you into breakout groups. And I think that we have, so we're working with seven, Um We're working with six, six, six breakout groups. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like you to go through these perspectives. And we're going to ask you to pick the ones that are the most different to your common perspective. So I'll read them out for you. So starting out, we have the oil gas company. And the perspective of the oil gas company is that fossil fuels are my core business. I need to protect my employees and my profits. There we go. Then we have... Packages, people who are producing packaging. Plastics are light, durable, easy to pack, and they don't break. We produce the cheapest packaging solutions. And then we have store owners who are you know, needing to put their wares into some form of packaging. And what they would say potentially is we go with any packaging that guarantees freshness, won't break, stacks easily, and attracts customers. And then we have what we've named high plastic consumers. So these are people who tend to use a lot of plastic. So people in their homes um, and they're buying a lot of things that are in plastic. So I'm very busy or perhaps I'm very poor and I have no possibility other than using the resources that are readily available around me. So I need to shop local and I can only buy what is available in the shops around me. Then we have your climate activist. And what they might say is, you're ruining, ruining our future. This has to stop now. I will go that extra mile to avoid plastics. I'll spend more and I'll go out of my way to shop plastic free. And then you have the plastic sorters. I have to feed my family. So those are the people who are actually sorting the recycling. I have to feed my family and this is not a good job. It doesn't pay well either, but at least I do get some income. So these are our six different perspectives, perspectives that we have identified. So I'm going to put them up in the chat so that everybody can have a look at them while they're choosing. Yeah, so take a good look at them. And we're going to invite you, we, we, we're going to invite three people um, to pick each one of these perspectives. And, and three people will go into a breakout group together and discuss. And the question that we're going to ask you to discuss is what can we, from our perspective, contribute um, on the situation to solving the plastic pollution problem? So what can we contribute, considering our perspective on the situation, to solving the plastic pollution problem? So Lidave is going to invite you to think on a first come, first serve. Definitely. First come, first serve. Yes, to... So again, try to choose one that you're not feel very aligned with, right? If you're a climate activist, go for something else. If you're an, uh, an oil uh, gas company, <laughs> go for something <laughs> else. <laughs> Try to choose something that you maybe feel a bit of friction with. Um, so the oil gas company, who would like to go for that perspective? Jim. Jim is in the oil gas company. One or two more. Elif is going there. Let me get you in, Elif. Could you read the screen and tell me who's putting up their hands, Catherine? Yes. So um, the next one is going to be the packages. So 
Kate is going in the packages. Zara and is going. And I have Lotte as well. So and Lotte. OK, that's fine. We Three is fine. So I have actually here, um, Dana <laughs> says, <laughs> I'll do that one, but I didn't see which one. Dana, could you say which one? Katerina in packages. Katerina wants to go in the packaging? OK, yes. let me. <laughs> Let me see. So we have four people in the packages. We need to divide it about evenly, but let's see if this yeah. works. That's fine. And Dana, where did Dana want to go? So, so Dana wanted to go in the oil and gas, and so did um, Rena. Okay, perfect. You are there. The store owners. So, the, so the store owners, we have Golda and Golda. Sarah. And Sarah. Okay, perfect. And then the high plastic consumers. Sarah the Angelis. Oh, I might need to make sure I put the right Sarah in the right. Uh, group. Yeah, Sarah's so, in there. I need two so more for have... the high plastic consumers. So high plastic consumers. Mark. So mar mark to high plastic. Yeah. And we could go to the consumer if we don't have anyone. Safia to the high plastic. Katerina says I could go to the consumers. Katerina, did I hear you? Yeah. Katerina is going in. And there was one more. Who did you say, Catherine? Safia. Safia. And Mark, Safia. Yeah, to high plastic. Perfect. And then, and then low, low plastic consumers. Climate activists. We have left Aparna. Aparna, are you with us? And we have the plastic sorters as well, right? Yes, yeah. So the yeah. climate activist. We have. So Megan says she can do any. So, ah. Megan, <laughs> so, so climate ah. activist, Megan, is this, yeah. which are you least um, aligned with, climate activist or plastic sorters? Um, I, I actually lost track of it. Um, uh, I would, I wanted to be in the high plastic. I was, I don't know why I thought of, you know, plastic consumers as householders. Um, ah, I was just waiting for that. Um, right. But, uh, but I can go was, into any. Okay. So, so, um, and, and, um, Greg, are you Wait. joining us as well? No, but I'm, I'm going to stay here to keep an eye on the, the room. So thank you okay. for inviting me. Okay, perfect. And we have Isha in the plastic sorters. I'm wondering if we could put Isha in with the um, with the act climate activists, as otherwise I think you only have one in that. Two. One. I have two in the climate activists at the moment. So and plastic sorters. And plastic sorters only Isha at the moment. So if anyone else, especially from the high plastic consumers or from the oil gas company, or from the packager, says hey. I'll go to the plastic sorters. Let me know now. Nobody does? Okay. Well, maybe we... Ah, Mark does. Um, Mark, were, you were in the consumers, weren't you? Yeah. And Sarah also. Which Sarah? Z no, Zara. Ah, Zara. 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 Yeah, I see you Zara, in the packagers. Yeah. Zara is going to the sort. Perfect. We've got them all. Okay, okay. Cool. exercise, hey? Nice yes. online work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with us. Great. We're going so to send a you moment, off. a moment before you go into your rooms. Again, I would just like you to take a moment and in terms of really embodying, I want you to just read through your perspective again. So it's in the chat. And to imagine. Imagine that person or representative of that um, perspective. Imagine what would they look like? How would they speak? What sort of a person would they be? 
and it might help to imagine somebody somebody that you know or a high profile person that you know represents that um, perspective and create a picture of it of that person how do they hold themselves how do they represent themselves how are they likely to say what are the kinds of things they're likely to say and to almost step into it so that you actually become that person and so I'm going to want you to imagine their facial expressions. How would they hold their face? How would they, what would their voice be like? What type of way of speaking would they have? And to actually embody that imagination that you've created as if you were that person. And now to stay in that kind of embodied role we're going to put you into breakout groups. And first step is to identify one person who will take some notes and be able to report back to us when we come back into the plenary, but then to have a discussion together. And the topic that we would like you to discuss is what can we contribute from our perspective to solving the plastic, solution, plastic pollution problem? Off you go. Great. We'll see you back in 10 minutes. 10 minutes, yeah. Yeah, Lotta is in her group, um, but she has two accounts, so she might be, she might only need one, maybe. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> sure. You have two profiles, you have two um, faces, Greg. Two That's because I have um, two computers running. Uh, yeah. Okay. One is a backup. Uh, ah, in, good. Yeah. In case also, you get kicked out. Well, we the very first workshop we did, my um, my computer froze up. This was right. the one that this is the one that Elif was um, talking about that uh, mm. everything froze up and and so that's when I got an Ethernet cable for both my laptops and I'm running both of them just in case. Excellent. Yeah. Which is also, also why you all are co-hosts as well. So if I got right. kicked, you would still be able yeah, to, to continue. Yeah. 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 Um, oh, oh, Greg, are you timing that or Lidl, are you timing? I am. Um, quarter past started? they started. So up till um, 25. Would that work, Catherine? Yeah. 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 Yeah, from 15 to 25 yeah. yeah 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 so i think one thing to really um stress when we go into that next phase is that mm. we want their answers to this question hey maybe yes. I'll, I'll broadcast that as well we want their answers to this question i know that they all have all sorts of um cognitive you know work going on around it but we really yeah. want their answer from yeah. stepping into that role did I put that out as a, as a reminder? Yeah, I think that's good. Do you, Greg, do you have a, a solution for voices that fail halfway through? I'm having a frog. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> You, you, do you have do you have two voice boxes there? Oh, that's very <laughs> weird. Huh. <laughs> no, it's her. It's her. I'm, her frog. No, I'm saying I have a frog. I feel as though my voice is. Um, <laughs> uh, well, all of last week and the week before, <clears throat> when we were in the the summit and the workshop, 
my voice was just this close to going out. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We've also been doing quite a lot of online work and it <clears throat> does um, a lot of talking. It brings all sorts of um, physical problems, hey? This online work. You know well, what? My eyes, my eyes are just so because I'm on the computer all the time, um, including many of my classes I teach at night. Yeah. So I think I might have to get new glasses or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not easy, eh? One of my students, um, it looks like she might have had to go to a meeting, but she was here in the room. Um, I think I mentioned her to you. She. Um, she just graduated this last spring and she wrote her thesis uh, and maybe I shared it with you. Yes, you did. You did. I had yeah, a look that's at right, it. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but she's very interested in climate issues. So I'm, I'm glad that she was able to show up for at least part of today. Mm. Yeah, she, she, so she, she she's put a little message in the chat. Um, Alison, yeah, another meeting, but thank you so much. Yes, well, I'm glad that she was able to be yeah. here. Oh, great. I had some nice contact with her during the conference. I told her that she, it might be interesting for her because she's very much into this perspective taking literature. Um, and so, you know, this, I, I think it's very important in the imaginative empathy to move beyond that, you know, self, other, um, cognitive, emotional, and to really start, you know, there's so much more that influences us in how yeah. we perceive others than just that head. <laughs> yeah. There's so much more going on. So how do you live into those experiences and how do you yeah. recognize, you know, this experience is actually a projection of myself on that person. I'm not empathizing at all. I'm just, you know, projecting my own on that person. And that's really difficult, difficult, difficult. Well, that that exercise you had us do with the photograph of the two men in the in the fishing boat was fascinating. Uh, and people reacted, of course, in the way that I'm sure you would um, have anticipated them reacting. Yes, yes. Um, yes. And that is, yes. you know, we all have our our perspective, <laughs> our point of view, and we're all almost certainly wrong. Yeah. 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 And we're fun. all. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I was also, you know, we look at it with the outsider view, right? Imagine really that you are in that boat every day. You think yes. you're still seeing that plastic other than that it's ending up in your nets all the time. But, you know, you no. walk that best plastic beach. Do you think you're still seeing it or is it just your, your environment? Mm -hmm. Well, we um, sometimes with my students, when I introduce the idea of empathy, um, and I'm thinking I might need to do a whole course on it. But anyway, it, it comes into some of my classes and, and broadly defined, the students think of empathy as stepping into somebody else's shoes. Yes, I yes. I mean, that's, that's what people think, right? Yeah. I think that's reasonable. It's probably yeah. not a um, wrong way to think about it. But then the deeper conversation comes from what you illustrated with that, uh, that photograph and that deeper conversation is, but can you really, can you really step into somebody else's shoes? Um, and you can't because you don't have the same lived experience they do. Mm -hmm. um, you don't know what their background is. Um, you know, do they have a, dis a hidden disability? What is their socioeconomic background? What is their political mm -hmm. belief system? Um, yeah. And, and yet, the Greg, you, of you that, can eh? ask. You, so yeah. you can invite with curiosity and you can ask and you can start to construct an experience. And I think the thing is that the more skilled you are at really encouraging a person to communicate their real lived experience, then you do have something to potentially um, within it as if um, imaginative exercise to potentially work on. Yeah. 
We haven't, because that's the thing. I mean, coming to that conclusion, and we all come that, to that conclusion in, at some point in time, right? Can we really? Uh, we can't. And then, and then that is the next, like, dead end street. Is because you can't really. You haven't gone through this. You don't know what it is like, right? This is what we hear all the time from people. And that's true in a sense, I haven't gone through it. So I don't know what it is like for you at that moment in time, but I can inquire into what it is like. And I think that's the art of empathy is to mm. inquire into it. And also especially to then hold the space for it, even there where you disagree, because you're not agreeing with all of it. And the aim of the game is not to agree with it, right? The aim of the game is to, this is another way that is just as valid as mine of looking at this issue. And it's valid not because it is good or bad, right? It's valid because it is, it is. We can't ignore it, it's there. So that's, you know, the discussion that we had about racism, for instance, at, at the last day, right? It is there. We, we cannot step away from it. We, ca we can, of course, we can do as we like, but yeah. if we just step away from it, right? Then how do we come to solutions to these problems? It's so can, complicated. Maybe can I broadcast a one minute? Yes, uh, one perfect. minute. Yeah. And Nidaway, do you, and I know you've done this workshop before and this exercise that people are in right now, that's mm -hmm. clearly the point of, mm -hmm. of Exercise is yes. to step into the role of the oil and gas company, for example, to yeah. to at least start to formulate some some thoughts or perspective about that role. Yeah. As opposed mm. to the 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 store owners who are looking to um, make a profit and have their products um, with longer shelf life. Yeah. For Yes, that's, but that's only part of it, Steve, Greg. You'll see, we, I'm breaking up the rooms. We're going to continue. <laughs> no, this is great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, they have another minute. They can just ignore us for another minute. <laughs> yeah. You can always tell how well engaged the groups are by whether they push it to the last second or not. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <clears throat> 18, 17, 16. Oh, yeah? Why do you see that? 15, 11 seconds at the bottom of. Oh, my... yeah, oh, there. Oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> you learned Good. something new every the last second. <laughs> yeah. Um, there we go. <laughs> you say we can always tell how engaged you are in your breakout groups when you leave it to the last second to come back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. so I've been broadcasting to all of you. I hope um, each group has a representative who's going to give us their solution from their perspective to this problem. And we're gonna go through a few iterations, but we start with that. Just give us your solution or what you could come up with to this problem. And then we'll have time to discuss a bit more about all because I'm quite sure people have to say things about this. So let me start with, well, let me start with the oil and gas, the beginning of the chain. What do you think you could be contributing to this problem? So I, I took some notes, so I'm happy to share some of that. The um, I, I'm not sure we came up with a solution. Um, I, I think that uh, some of the things that we talked about is lobbying for incentives uh, to help uh, that the industry move in a new direction, or perhaps an oil and gas executive who is a bit more of a business futurist sees the writing on the wall that the that plastic production is not the future, and and therefore might feel like going in another direction might be helpful. Um, we also talked about finding frameworks that, um, that emphasize more social responsibility that may help encourage, uh, encourage a company or an executive to, to take some sort of action. Um, thinking that 
in some ways an executive may feel as trapped as uh, into their current path as a person who's having to deal with the plastic. Like we, if, it, if there was another solution, we would have figured it out because we're smart. Um, but we, we have a responsibility to shareholders. We have a responsibility to our, to our business folks. Um, and so without some kind of help, like an incentive system or something else, then but we can only do what we can do. Yeah, yeah, fantastic, Jim. Thanks, great. Second, the packagers. Um, okay, I will say that I'm a little bit projecting because we had a super fascinating conversation um, that didn't necessarily lead to exactly these words, but I'm projecting that the solution will be something that allows us to continue, and this is today in the present. The solution would be something that allows us to continue to produce plastics out of petrochemicals. Um, so the solution will emphasize more and better recycling. Yeah, 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 I imagine. Thanks. And the store owners. Hi, there were just two of us. Mm -hmm. um, and we had different use cases. So I, I was a health food store and we uh, talked about um, that the, that market is conscious, conscious consumers that really care about the nature of the packaging. And even though it might be more expensive to choose biodegradable or, or reusable uh, solutions, that could be repurposed. Uh, we I, we looked at the increased cost would uh, actually improve sales and create a competitive advantage. Hmm. And my, hmm. my partner, uh, she was looking at the bakery and coffee shop across the street that had uh, that uh, provides meaningful employment for uh, disabled workers. And so she was, uh, even, even though uh, the sustainable packaging uh, uh, might cost more money, uh, being able to train the disability workers to perhaps create some sustainable solution uh, for, for the bakeries a wish to uh, be more conscious uh, okay. would be a great way to go. Just the thanks. two. Thanks. Thanks, mm -hmm. Golda. Great, great. The high plastic consumers, what's your solution? Hi, this is um, Safia. So we discussed a number of things and at, at an individual level, um, weaning ourselves off of disposable uh, plastics, um, for example, buying less bottled water or at the grocery store, not putting your produce in the um, single use plastic bags and instead be putting your produce immediately directly into um, your cart. Um, and then at a policy level, I think we agreed that um, supporting a bag tax or ban um, probably would have the most, as we've seen, um, long lasting impact and change. And, and did, you feel, did you feel as a group that this was feasible considering your perspective? Did you feel like, you know, we're up for it? Not really. <laughs> okay. um, so. I'm not not as individuals, but I think of who we were thinking of. Yes, exactly. That's yeah. I, I take you entirely as a high plastic consumer at the moment, not as a yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so yeah, we there is some solution. That we were not that hot for it, but we did come up with some, right? That's yeah. what you I think that we encountered probably a lot of um cynicism in what um and in, in the individuals that we envisioned yeah right yeah, yeah. great yeah. thank you yeah and then the climate activists um megan you want to go ahead uh sure, we, we, we didn't nominate one of us we just talked <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> to do it together yeah all right uh megan after you 
Okay. Um, so we talked mostly about like, because this person is already doing a lot. Um, and so we talked about more like co collaborative and community based solutions that they could champion. Yeah. Um, so, you know, some of the examples that we thought about was, for instance, if, you know, we're planning a city, uh, can we plan it in a way that there's a robust public transportation? So we all, you know, share that resource as opposed to, so, you know, would, would one bus be better than, you know, 10 or 20 cars being on the road? And that sort of a idea is one thing. And then we also spoke very briefly about, is it possible to restrict access to, you know, these very fast technologies, like, you know, like, like we could operate quite well without having the need to have all of these, you know, high uh, speed into like, you know, we, I, we appreciate that, but, but if it's causing an impact that is harmful on the environment, can we restrict the use to purposes actually served by that kind of a technology? Hmm. Like the question of this, does everyone need to have that? So right. what's the intention? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, yeah. that was what we talked about. Yeah, yeah. And so for the for the two of you, was this a perspective that was difficult to get into or was this something that you identify with a bit already? Um, it For me, it was a bit difficult because I am not like I think I don't know enough about what a climate activist does. I don't know. And my knowledge is quite limited. But then um, uh, I'm, I'm a yoga practitioner and yoga, we believe that change happens from the individual. Mm -hmm. you, should, you know, like Gandhi says, you know, you've got to be the change that you want to see around yourself. So, so, you know, if, so, so thinking from that perspective, what if I am a climate activist, what can I do in that direction? That, yeah. you know, gives some possibilities. Perfect. That was the exercise. Great. Thank you, Aparna. Great. Thank you, Megan. Yeah. And then we have one group left. Let me see the, oh, the plastic, plastic sorters. sorters. The sorters. So we, we all imagined ourselves would make sense as on the sort of the lower end of the economic ladder if we're doing yeah. this job, whether we're in the third world or in an inner city somewhere, uh, even in, in the developed world. Um, and I think, you, you know, so the really it, it's but we all spoke to individual action so if we're we first of all doing the best job that we possibly can right if uh the, the better that our job can be done um the more plastic gets sorted correctly and doesn't end up in the ocean and that you know we if, if it's not being done correctly we can raise our voices with someone in authority um or join a local community group that that's trying to solve the problem in our in our community um it's so a really it's very much about individual empowerment and action um and within the limited scope of influence that we have but zara or isha any thing to add thank you mark i think you did an amazing job summarizing all our thoughts thank you mark mm -hmm. Yeah, great. It's an interesting perspective also, hey, that perspective of the sorter with the limitations. And that's actually what we'd like to discuss with you more in general, like what limitations does that perspective that you've been taking on, what limitations does that bring to, the, to trying to solve this problem? And maybe, you know, just speak up or put it in the chat. Let us know in this perspective, what limitations, what biases do we bring from that perspective to solving this problem? Kate? Um, I, I think the limitation that it comes down to in, in the case of the producers, uh, is that what it was? Packager, packagers, um, is the question of um, whether Honestly, I want to bring that Jim, Jim's still there. I want to bring it back to what Jim brought up either in his workshop or the presentation last week or both, um, or your group did, it was last week, which is, do you have the okay from the very top to make a radical change? Because, mm -hmm. because I, and I've been in these meetings with, with people like this, um, 
either because the question ultimately is, are you willing to drop petrochemicals from the basis of your production? And and Lottie had some really interesting ways she was going into looking at this that's both focused on the the characteristics of the products and mm -hmm. But but we hadn't yet stepped back to the are we willing to drop petrochemicals and actually figure out, you know, both looking in the past or looking in the future, how do you get those same characteristics again? Mm -hmm. And so to me, that is the absolute dividing line with packagers, people who create packages is the way I was thinking of packagers. Mm -hmm. um, because because the argument for more recycling ultimately does not get at the heart of the problem, but you yeah. cannot do anything but argue for that if that's what your corporation is about. If your yeah. corporation mm. is about continuing to produce petrochemical, yeah. then you have to frame your functionality within that. Exactly. So the limit that you're seeing from that perspective, Kate, is that whatever the solution is going to be, it's going to be projected forward after it has passed through the packages right after it has passed through your stage yeah. because we are not going to drop our petrochemicals we need to make this so so it needs to be solved after we've been putting it on the market right and the um the radical movement of that corporation could be to retool as people producing packages that that have those same characteristics but are not any more part of the plastics chain that's the radical break that they could do but I based it on they're not yet doing that. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, Jim, I, something to add? Yeah, yeah. I think that <laughs> there's a locus of control issue. Like, yeah. like a lot of people feel like they they need permission in order to change, whether that's from shareholders or from their consumers. Like, well, uh, soda is a good example, or well, bottles of water is a good example. One of the reasons we don't go to to cardboard is because well, they can't see the water. And the consumers want to see that the water is clean, that it's mm -hmm. clean and clear. There's nothing in it. And so it, everybody seems to be waiting for someone else to give them permission to change because they yeah. don't feel like they have a personal locus of control. Yeah. And so how about your perspective, Jim, and your whole group, hey, the perspective at the source of this whole chain? What is the, what is the limiting factor in that perspective? I think it's just that it's either either stakeholders or vision uh, of that company to decide that we need to divest and turn in a new direction because there's a dead end that we're facing. Um, I think without yeah without that without somebody to take that in a different direction, you will have people who feel like well I can only I, I, I'm stuck within this system and mm -hmm. therefore I, I there's nothing I can do. I think that's mm -hmm. People want to believe that there's nothing they can do because then it doesn't, then it's not like, then it's, it's not a matter of you're just not doing everything you can. It's like, I can't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I just would yeah. like to add two to that. Um, what, what you had just said about, you know, the idea that, you know, people, if you put water in, in cardboard as opposed to plastic, people might not buy it um, because they don't, they can't see the water. Um, it's much harder to be that one executive that says, let's do that anyway, because likely you're not gonna have as profitable of a product as all of the other companies that are still producing in plastic. So I, I've mentioned this in the chat earlier and something that I think about a lot is like, how will individual solutions really create larger change or does it have to be a much more collective thing? Um, because I think it's gonna take more than just one oil and gas company making a shift um, because if it ultimately means that costs are higher or consumers are down the line, you know, that's not going to have a greater impact because if that company just folds um, because their costs are higher and they can't produce, then, then what's the actual impact? So I hear a lot of mention of, of profits. So when one's looking at, we, you know, we also hear a lot of um, mention about the system and the, um, <clears throat> the kind of the, the context within which um, versus the one or other executive who might have a bit more of a radical approach. So in, the question is, you know, what is that bias? What is the bias that is driving that particular perspective? Because if one is wanting to really be able to 
um, at a high level initiate change, one wants to be able to really understand the, the driver. What is, what is the, um, that core driver? It's, it's so, just profit, I would say, right? Numbers. I think they, they only care about numbers and that's how they, the business is driven unless the world provides a new framework through which the companies are judged mm -hmm. and not just through their responsibility to their own shareholders, but maybe to the planet. And, and there are these frameworks that are being developed like ESGs, you know, economic, social governance. And, and uh, so there are these uh, new approaches to hold uh, businesses accountable, for, not just for their, you know, uh, uh, profits or you know their business line but how you know somebody mentioned the life cycle of things basically uh -huh. how is your product or how is your industry affecting the well-being of the planet and and the way they get at it is not because that not through like judging or putting a like a moral oh you know like uh do you realize what mm. you're doing but uh, uh -huh. instead of that they're putting a monetary value of the loss of their reputation in that way uh -huh. So right. if you do not do this, your reputation loss will cost you X. Yeah. Yeah. And then that gets them sort of, oh, you know. So it is yeah. purely numbers. And I think, I think also the lack of uh, systems thinking, you know, mm -hmm. this, you know the, how the education is, um, is <laughs> mostly that, you know, we, we are thought, you know, these disciplines and businesses are sort of like fragmented things that do not really connect. Mm -hmm. I mean, I noticed that, you know, uh, most of us are talking as if the, the oil refiners are also uh, responsible of plastic production. They are mm -hmm. not. They might just mm -hmm. be the ones that getting the oil out of the ground and have nothing to do with plastic production. So, and that's well, they do. They do. But it's, I understand do. the some point. Do. Yeah. Some do. Some do. Not yeah. all. Exactly. Them. Not all of them. So, no. Yeah. So, so we cannot just, you know. So, so it is important to, I think, instill in our education, in our expectations from society, this sort of appreciation of the systems that we yeah. live in, I think, lacking. Like mm. But let's go back to the individual as well, right? So if we're looking at the climate activists, the climate activist is maybe not driven by the numbers as much as the refineries or the packagers or that. So, but the climate activist also has a bias. Could we identify the bias of the climate activist as well. Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to, you know, uh, share a thought here. Like recently, you know, there was this movie that I watched in Tamil and it was about, you know, um, how this guy, you know, goes around the country and, and learns, you know, firsthand from farmers and, and, and uh, you know, businesses that operate off of the products of agriculture. And, and he brings it back to his village where he tells them about like, you know, for instance, if someone's a sugarcane farmer, the general notion is that this is being used to produce sugar. But what happens with the, you know, the fiber that's left after extracting sugar and so on and so forth. So just knowing this kind of a thing, it, um, you know, instills like knowing what we're doing, what we're using, what are the different things that have happened for that to come to us and what will happen when we refuse it? Mm -hmm. I think that awareness at the individual level should help us realize that, you know, things are not always meant to be used once and just thrown. Like if something like in our grandparents' generation, some of our grandparents still, you know, like they fix things mm -hmm. and reuse it. And it's passed around to all the cousins and the family. You know, if, he, if one cousin has a book, it gets passed on to the other cousins when they're at the age to experience and appreciate it similar thing with clothes. And so, so this is like one way that, you know, um, if as a climate activist, we can inform people, we can make them aware, we can do programs, uh, use mm -hmm. social media to spread awareness about, you know, what you see is just one aspect of its use. There is so much more to it. And now what can you do? That could be a powerful tool as well. Mm -hmm. to inspire maybe not everybody will change in the beginning but you know the, the the moment that this becomes a trend so to say you know we're talking about social media right so, so it, it goes viral becomes, it goes <laughs> viral right and and i think uh, i think that's one way to affect change um 
mm. to know, you know, the downstream mm. consequences of mm. what we're using. And um, yeah. I think you're right. So Pana, that's, you know, the climate activist has that contribution to make to the, to the problem, right? And from a climate activist perspective, it's quite easy also to look at that contribution because we're almost, we're all judging that the climate activist in this um, um, issue is on the right side of the balance, right? Those yes. are the good guys, the climate yeah. activists. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they're not just the good guys, right? They're also yeah. having biases. They also bring their specific perspective, which can be so extreme that there is no way of taking in what the other parties involved in this problem are bringing to the table. And we, we're going to wrap this up because we have 10 more minutes and we promised that we would do something else with you. So we're going to wrap this up. But that's one of the, the, the points that we would like you to mull over a bit more um, after this session is to look into this, all these perspectives they have their biases, so they have their, this is the way I see the world and I can't get beyond it. I need to make money mm. or I need to put the, the responsibility in front of me or I need to, you know, these are my, this is what, this is my interest in the issue. But they also have things to contribute. And imaginative empathy, doing these type of exercises is meant to really enlarge in your own space of seeing these perspectives. Because there's really no point coming as a climate activist to a packager to say, you're wrong, I'm right, you have to see it my way, we're going to do it this way, right? You need to come and, and really understand, get an understanding of where that industry is coming from to then try and help them to see those solutions, right? If it's all polarization, like we're doing constantly in our world at the moment, we don't get anywhere. We just don't get mm. anywhere. So being able to expand those perspectives and to hold space for all those perspectives, that's really what we think is the crux of imaginative empathy to expand as much as we can before we dive into, it must be this way, it can't be that way. Raha, you wanted to say something? Hi, yes, sorry, I missed the morning um, session, but um, I just wanted to mention, um, my name is Raha uh, Hallaj and I'm an architect and I do a lot of sustainable designs and green building and all the, but, uh, the idea of a new thing is uh, circular economy. Mm -hmm. And um, there's few books that are out there, but it's kind of a hot subject uh, as mm -hmm. uh, some of us mm -hmm. are discussing here about bringing together the, the cradle to cradle uh, and the circular of um, whether it's plastic, whether it's trading, whether it's whatever it is, but it's a really the only way at this stage of climate issues we've been dealing with for 20 years um, <clears throat> as something that will bring us forward in our, um, in our activism and our trials mm -hmm. in our profession and our home and our society and culture and the universe. Yeah. So just wanted to mention this idea of global yeah. circular economy right now is yeah. helping a lot. Yeah, in this thanks Ralph, I, I think that's, in this, so I put the link to the, to the, you haven't seen it, but I showed a three minute introduction to a documentary on, on the story of plastic in the beginning. This is the link to that documentary. Oh. In the end of that documentary, they are also posing that as one of the main solutions to this problem. So what we would like to contribute to that is oh. again, you know, all these perspectives that are involved in making that happen, Yes. They need to have a place at the table. They need to be seen. They need to be heard. They need to be empathized with. And they need to be empowered to contribute to that solution. And instead of that polarization that I was just speaking about. You want anything to add, Catherine? Uh, yeah, I think, I think one thing that I would like to add in terms of the actually taking the perspective or um, creating an imagination of that other perspective is perhaps just a little challenge. So we are a group of people who are um, very concerned about the environment and we all feel rightly so. Um,
but I'm, I'd like you to perhaps reflect on when you were taking that perspective of that other that you know group that you went into. To what extent was that bias of yours actually present as you were um, discussing your solutions? And did you did you feel you were really taking this perspective from their perspective, which perhaps they have different views on the plastics issue and the um, <clears throat> you know the environment and what have you. So it's, it's really just a challenge for you to reflect on because um, again, it is so difficult to drop that bias. And we are a group of people with a particular bias. And so entering into that perspective, very likely, I think a lot of the solutions I heard were coming very much from that bias. Um, we may feel that it is the correct way to go about it, but to what extent would that, if you were in negotiations with people who carry that perspective, to what extent are you actually a, um, able to step into their perspective in a way that you're not alienating them early on by bringing your own biases? So that's just really a reflection on the solutions that I heard and something for you to reflect on. So we're very close to the end. We have six minutes. What we would like to do now is to ask you one thing that stood out from, for you from this workshop, from the exercises that we've taken. So not necessarily at this point um, so much the topic, it could also be the process. What stood out for you so far? And of that that stood out for you, how would you take that into action? So intention into action and transfer it to real life. What, what would you like to take? And you can write that in the chat as well. So Mark says, elevating personal stories to build empathy. So how can you imagine, Mark, in the next week, next month, month actual <laughs> month, <laughs> what would you, how would that look? What would you do? A real, a real live example. So I am talking with some activists now who are living downwind from pollution in the Allegheny Mountains from fracking, and uh, they they have developed personal stories to help win their, their case and then really working with them to elevate that. And, and I think connecting the scholarship around personal stories and empathy to what is actually happening on the ground. And mm. Great, yeah. Mm, great, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Jim had to hop off. Dana, they, there were more stakeholder perspectives than I think I, sorry, that's jumped up. I would have come up with on my own. My takeaway is about the importance of taking into consideration as many stakeholder groups as possible when it comes to large scale systemic. So Dana, do you have an example in the next month where you can actually broaden your range of stakeholders that you can look at? Um, I don't have necessarily any um, specific examples, but I think that I'll just if anything, try to do more research into, into larger issues um, as I encounter them and think about them to really just try to consider, like I said, as, as many different perspectives as possible and, and how yeah. I might try to better understand um, people who think differently than me, especially um, when there are extreme differences. Great, thank you. Elif, I realize that every workshop that self-empathy is core to our journey I love how empathic intervision describes and facilitates self-empathy. Elif, what would you imagine doing with that in the next month? Oh, I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on thinking of ways to, you know, move forward this, you know, designing for empathy um, platform, you know, how, how best it could be useful. Um, so that's, I think, has something to do with that. But I, mm -hmm. I really appreciate, you know, how you uh, describe and really 
let us experience what self-empathy is. Uh, it, is, it is more than just self-compassion, you know, it's not just feeling, lighting candles and, you know, having a warm bath, you know, it's not that, but it's really mm. uh, holding space for ourselves, our own biases, you know, re really realizing what we are made of and, and also through interactions with others, uh, recognizing them in others. I think, I think that's uh, because to any conversation, be it climate change, being, be it, you know, the refugee problem or, you know, the war or any, any other uh, problem, uh, I think that begins with us. And, and, the, 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 and the, the dialogue is only as valuable if everyone around the table comes with that tool set that they all know what self-empathy is and we are here to hold space for each other's views. And even if you don't mm -hmm. agree, and we have always room to grow and we have to be expansive. And then, then, you know, then maybe we can really talk about some solutions, but that trust, I think that self-empathy, the way you are facilitating is, has a lot to do with this, uh, with trust also, trust building. Mm. Uh, I really appreciate yeah. this opportunity. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. And also creating a safe space for tricky situations. Things, yeah. And having those yeah. tricky conversations as well. Hey, I really the touchy feely aspect of empathy of it all needs to be nice and friendly and loving. And that's, in our opinion, that's not what empathy is about. It's really about. Uh, that's why we keep saying holding space. How how extreme these perspectives might be, we need to hold space because they are, and they're not. It's they are. Right? They exist. We can't just ignore them and say, I don't want to know, they exist. So we need to work with that in a way. There's been some really great things in the chat. We don't want to yeah. um, um, ask too much of your time, but there's some very um, actionable outcomes, which is the, the other thing that we really love to say is like when Kate says, and Kate, please, please let me know what you find out because I was so shocked by this, um, this finding that plastic can only be recycled once. So Kate's gonna find out for us if that's really the case. And I hope we hear back from you, Kate. <laughs> Very <laughs> actionable, right? What can we do? And that is the other thing that, you know, one of the things we do with empathy is we sit, we empathize, we think, we discuss, and then we go home. <laughs> And it's a shame, right? We go home, but what do we do at home? What can we do with that? Coming from another informed perspective and just something as what Kate's saying, and there's many more things, I'm just putting one out. Sarah also had a great one about, oh, you know, being so overwhelmed in the beginning and so much and that living into these fictional persona felt really energizing. So doing more of that generative creative mindset. Thanks for that, Sarah. Yeah, and many more, I can't yeah. Thank you all very much for joining us. And we really yeah. enjoyed working with you and yeah, putting out And if some... you want to find us somewhere, I'll put the link in the chat. Thank you all very much, Lita Wei and Catherine, especially uh, thank you for leading a very thoughtful and engaging workshop. But really thank you all for being here and participating um, and getting your, mm. uh, your empathy exercise in for the day. Um, you will see that I pasted into the chat box a link to the uh, participant survey. We would love it if you would take a moment to give us a little bit of feedback about this workshop. Very helpful as we plan for next year. Um, Elif, is there anything that you would like to say before we close our program today? Yes, and thank you so much everyone for being here. And I just wanna mm. mention that, you know, our friends at Empathic Intervision, they offer this curriculum where you can actually take a course, entire weeks long, months long course on empathy, exploring all the aspects of empathy, not just imaginative empathy, but starting with kinesthetic empathy to you know, all the other aspects and, and uh, in, a, in a small group setting, which I have myself benefited greatly. So I'm grateful for that opportunity again. And, and each time you, you, you conduct a workshop, <laughs> I learned something amazing. I'm just, uh, I'm a big fan of your work. Thank you so much for being a part of this uh, summit and uh, all your support. And I hope we mm -hmm. get to collaborate in the future. 
Uh, I'm, I have some yeah. ideas, but as always, we'll see. First, I have to get better with my back. So then, yeah. then get back but on all, all of this work can only be done because you are all there. Eh? So yeah, I to exactly. re-emphasize we, that we really, it's wonderful to work with everyone. I, this is the end of our summit and I enjoyed it so much. It was so great to meet all of you in all these different settings. So yeah, thank you. Well and, done and to you, you Elif, Wonderful, Elif. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Well thank done. And Greg, and Greg. Thank you, Greg, for holding <laughs> us all. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your day or evening. Take yeah. care. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye